Hey guys, today we're diving into the Jed Brophy Return to Middle-Earth Party, or rather, episode 3 of The Rings of Power titled Adar. We get a good amount of time in Numenor, the return of practical effects orcs, the answer to Sauron's symbol, and possibly some new clues into Halbrand's true identity. Right off the bat, we find out it was indeed orcs who captured Arondir at the end of episode 2. His armor and weapons have been taken away, and he's dragged through a kind of tunnel trench system by the orcs. They've got prisoners, and we can see canopies overhead meant to protect the orcs from the sunlight. As we've been told, the orcs being harmed by sunlight is going to be a big deal in this series. We've seen that the lands that will become Mordor don't look anything like the desolate wasteland they are in The Lord of the Rings, so the orcs aren't protected from the sun. Side note, this is why Urukai are such a big deal during the War of the Ring. They don't have this weakness of regular orcs when it comes to sunlight. And while a Rondir is drifting into consciousness, we get a quick glimpse of two orcs running down a tunnel. And the second one, who looks much smaller, turns around and looks. I can't help but wonder if there's some significance here either with this orc or the fact that there's this side tunnel. While you could say they're making the tunnels for the purpose of staying out of sunlight, I can't help but think it would be much quicker to just travel at night and take shelter during the day. It makes me wonder if there's more to these tunnels than just a way out of the sun. I wonder if they might be using it to transport something in secret across the lands. It's hard to say at this point. And right away we have the triumphant return of fan favorite actor Jed Brophy to the world of Middle Earth. If you don't know him by name, you certainly know his work as he played Nori in The Hobbit and a variety of memorable characters in The Lord of the Rings. He was one of my first interviews here on the channel and I had a chance to hang out with him a bit at Comic-Con and he's a great guy with some really great stories from the films. It's definitely fun to see him back in Middle-earth and I hope we get to see more of him going forward. His orc here is named Vrath and we hear him talk back to another orc saying, you toss him out with the rest. I had sun duty yesterday. So right away we know the orcs take turns being the ones out in the sun. And when they are, they cover up in skins and skeletons of other creatures to protect themselves. And even then they run under cover when the full sun hits. Vroth comes up to Arondir and says, For Adar, which is the title of this episode and the name of the orcs leader. More on him in a bit. Arondir is tossed out in the sun and discovers his buddy from episode 1 and the Watch Warden have both been captured as well. The camera pulls back and we see the orcs have dozens of captives made to work as thralls digging this trench. I think they're mostly human characters with a handful of elves. I think if it had been a full company of elves, it would have been harder to believe the orcs had taken them all by surprise. But since it seems to be just a handful, it's a bit more understandable how they got taken. Cut to Galadriel who wakes up on the Numenorean ship and she immediately notices her dagger is gone. Halbran hooks her up with some food to which Galadriel asks if their hosts are saviors or captors. They're brought up to the main deck where we get our first true glimpse of Numenorians and most notably Elendil, father of Isildur and future High King of Gondor and Arnor. Elendil remarks that having one of the Eldar aboard his Numenorean ship is quite the strange tides. Galadriel starts to question Elendil, and he tells her to be at ease and that he's obliged to deliver them safely to his betters, who will answer her questions. This is our first hint that the Elendil we meet here is not the ruler he will become, and as we will learn, he is one who is in the midst of an incredibly dangerous political climate in Numenor. With a smirk, Elendil reveals they are nearly home, and Galadriel quickly notices that Elendil has her dagger but somewhat surprisingly restrains herself from going for it. As the ship approaches a gateway of the island realm, we start to hear Bear McCreary's Numenor track, and the watchtower to the side ignites a flame. No doubt this could be a small connection to the beacons of Minas Tirith used to communicate between Gondor and Rohan in the Third Age. As the ship passes through faces carved in the rock, we see a waterfall emitting from a statue of a figure alongside horses. As we'll see later in the episode, the Numenorians have a deep connection to the sea, which solidifies in my mind my theory that this is a statue of the Vala Ulmo, the Lord of Waters. Halbrand asks Galadriel what is this place, and Galadriel responds that there's only one place it can be, the land of the star, the island kingdom of Numenor. 
and we get an amazing shot of Numenor in all its glory. And this show continues to show its potential in terms of locales. Following up episode 2's reveal of Casa Doom with a realm I've been very much looking forward to. In this shot, we see another fire lit atop a tower, perhaps connected to the other one we saw if they are indeed beacons. The centerpiece here is the statue of Earendil, the father of Elrond and his twin brother Elros. Elros chose to be a mortal man and was Numenor's founder and first king. Alongside Earendil, we see a bird, which is actually a depiction of Elrond and Elros's mother, Elwing, when she was temporarily given bird form. Earendil has one of the Silmarils upon his brow, and during the War of Wrath, which was somewhat depicted in the prologue sequence, Earendil flies in his ship to fight the dragons of Morgoth. Ever after, he sails the skies as a star, which will actually come up again in this episode, and much later, as it's the light of this star that Galadriel has within her file she gives to Frodo. Also in this same shot, we see the mountain of Meneltarma. This is a holy mountain for the Numenorians and will likely be an important location before the end of this series. Also, I've mentioned this before in trailer breakdowns, but I like that the Earendil statue calls to mind the Argonath. Yet, whereas the Argonath have their arms out in defiance of their enemies, Earendil seems to be making a gesture of welcome. Next, we have an incredible wide shot showing just how massive the capital city of Armenelos is. We can also see a bit of similar architecture in the main building, as it has a bit of resemblance to the later city of Minas Tirith. Elendil starts leading their guests through the city, and we hear people whisper about the elf in their midst. And we'll soon realize why this is a big deal. Halron says, since when do men like me build kingdoms such as this? And Galadriel replies, they're not men like you. She then explains that while Halbrand's ancestors stood with Morgoth, the ancestors of the Numenorians, who we know from the books were called the Edine, stood with the elves. As a reward, they were given the land of the star, which Elros and his people found by following the star of Earendil, his father. What remains to be seen is if the show will go into other ways the Numenorians are distinguishable from regular men, namely their lifespan, which is considerably longer. Galadriel also reveals Numenor has changed much in the centuries that followed. For a while, elves were allowed to come to Numenor and they gave gifts to men, but in time, the Numenorians turned away their ships. This is indeed a concept from the books, for as the Numenorians turned their backs on the Valar and the elves, the elves were no longer welcome in Numenor by the King's Men faction, which had the majority of the people and power in Numenor. Only in secret to the faithful would the elves visit in the later days. And throughout this walk, Elendil has to keep looking back as Galadriel and Halbrand lag behind in what, as a parent, is something I can really relate to. Galadriel moves on, but Halbrand's attention is drawn by the smithies in what seems like a significant moment. More on that in a bit. They all clearly get their steps in for the day as they make their way up to what appears to be the royal building of Armenelos. We've got a couple more statues on the sides here, and of note here is that the right one is holding a sword whose pommel looks very reminiscent of Narsil from the Peter Jackson films. The one on the right has a similar crown design to the winged crown we see in those films as well. In the center, we have the white tree of Nimloth. Speaking of which, those gifts Galadriel mentioned earlier from the elves to the Numenorians, one of the first is the white tree of Nimloth, Another example is the Palantiri, the Seeing Stones, which we'll be seeing in a future episode. Now one thing I noticed when it comes to the White Tree is that the architecture around it is pretty much the only thing we see in a state of disrepair in Numenor. This could be a visual clue of the disregard the majority of Numenorians have for things that tie them to the Valar and Eldar. Elendil walks Galadriel and Halbrand up to a guard who basically says the Queen Regent and Chancellor Farazan ain't got time for that. And Elendil simply steps to the side and the guard, seeing Galadriel as an elf, decides maybe they do have time for that. Obviously having an elf in Numenor is a big deal and not something these folks ever expected and most never wanted. As we saw with Durin's reception of Elrond, we get another ruler addressing Galadriel simply as elf. 
Muriel, who is serving as queen regent in the stead of her father, King Tar Palantir, tells the elf to name herself. She responds Galadriel of the Noldor, daughter of the Golden House of Finarfin, commander of the northern armies of High King Gilgalad. Halbrand somewhat awkwardly declares himself as simply Halbrand of the Southlands. A couple notes here. First, I thought it was interesting that despite the tension between Gilgalad and Galadriel in the first episode, she still puts a tone of significance and respect on his name here. It came across to me as she's not only proud of her family, but also proud of her people. Also, thankfully the moment with Halbrand, while it does somewhat undercut the serious tone of what Galadriel says, it doesn't go into Marvel quip territory. In what was probably my least favorite promo piece among some pretty stiff competition for the title, this moment was edited with building music for Galadriel and a cut for Halbrand's punchline. Just like every serious moment that gets undercut with comedy in a Marvel movie. Thank goodness that's not how this was truly cut. If anything, Halbrand comes off as the awkward one, as everyone in the scene is serious and there's no music broadcasting the joke. To me at least, it seems more like it's not meant to undercut Galadriel, but just make Halbrand come off as a bit humorous. Back to the story at hand. Galadriel requests a ship's passage back to Middle-earth, to which Farazhan responds that it's been generations since a ship of Numenor made such a journey on an elf's behalf, to which Galadriel responds rather rashly that it's because of the Eldar that their people were given the island. Muriel responds that their ancestors were not given anything, but that they paid for the isle with the blood of their kin. And while certainly true from a certain point of view, this statement and the sentiments behind it certainly stem from Numenor's descent into more evil ways. It's one of what I'm guessing will be many instances showing us their pride and arrogance. Speaking of pride and arrogance, Galadriel says one way or another she will depart and she and Muriel go back and forth escalating tensions before Halbrand jumps in and negotiates they stay in Numenor for three days while they weigh their request. Galadriel says she will not be made a prisoner and Farazan says, nah, you'll be Numenor's guest as the guards come to escort them. Halbrand gives Elendil a fake hug of gratitude to steal Galadriel's dagger, which he gives back to her moments later. Again, this was a moment in that god-awful promo video that made it seem like there was some kind of love story going on between Halbrand and Galadriel. And while we're not out of the woods yet, this scene in context didn't seem so much like a love story to me, but rather Halbrand kind of getting to the same point we saw Elrond make in episode one, that Galadriel needs to find some measure of peace. Like I said, we're not out of the woods yet. There's still time for them to make a terrible decision and to make this into a love story to rival the likes of Keeley and Tariel, but hopefully not. Also of note is Halbrand says that Numenor is a paradise rife with opportunity. Does he simply mean a fresh start? Or could he be a baddie in disguise with bigger, more evil plans for this island realm? He also says he's been searching for peace longer than Galadriel knows. Again, perhaps this just means for a large chunk of his life, or maybe his life has been longer than any man's. Farazan and Muriel take counsel together, and while Muriel says Galadriel is but one elf, Farazan says an avalanche may start with one stone. Again, this seems like a callback to Gandalf in The Two Towers, when he says Merry and Pippin coming to Fangorn will be like the falling of small stones that starts an avalanche. Now for book fans, this could seem odd that Muriel and Farazan seem to be on the same side. But what I think's going on here is that Muriel is playing that she's aligned with the Kingsmen faction while secretly a member of the Faithful. What's interesting is that in one version of Tolkien's writings, Muriel actually falls in love with Farazan and willingly marries him despite the fact they're cousins. I don't think that's what's happening here, obviously, as I'm quite certain by the end of the episode we'll have an idea where her allegiance lies. The two talk of Elendil since he brought the visitors in, and Farazan mentions he's originally of a noble line, and now a sea captain, and his son is following him into service. And we cut to Numenorean ships at sea, with a seal door as a cadet learning the ways of the Numenorean navy. For a moment, he's distracted by an island, and we hear a female voice whisper, Isildur. Now this is still Numenor, but perhaps it's a different part of the island, potentially the western portion where his family's from. Also, I noticed that there's a bit of an echo placed on his friend yelling his name, 
that makes it perhaps a bit reminiscent of Hugo Weaving's famous Isildur line. Isildur gets his save the cat moment by saving a fellow cadet from flying off the ship via rope, and back on shore we learn the Numenorians have a mantra, the sea is always right. Which I guess is okay? I don't know, it definitely lacks any kind of poetry or beauty, it just seems super basic. We get an easter egg that the kid Isildur saved is named Imrahil, which is the name of Boromir and Faramir's uncle, the prince of Dol Amroth during the War of the Ring. Though he's obviously not the same person as this guy. Isildur's friends talk about passing their sea trial and moving up through the ranks over the coming years, and we first meet Isildur's sister, original character, Aarian. Next, we're back in the throne room, and Muriel says the faithful believe when the petals of the white tree fall, it is no idle thing, but the very tears of the Valar themselves. This plays into my theory that when we later see the petals falling in mass, it will be an attention-grabbing moment showing dark days are ahead for Numenor. Muriel goes on to question Elendil, asking him the meaning of his name, which Elendil responds means, one who loves the stars which is the Quenya translation of the name. When pressed, he hesitantly reveals that it's also known to translate to elf friend. And they go about this conversation where I think Muriel is trying to feel out if Elendil is one who remains faithful to the old ways, and Elendil is just trying to keep out of trouble. I'm keeping an eye out for things to develop between these two characters where they come to trust one another as members of the faithful. Muriel tasks Elendil with keeping an eye on Galadriel, and he's given a sword. And while it gets a close-up shot, I don't think this is Narsil at all. Narsil, being an heirloom of his family, I think will likely be taken up by Elendil at some point when he fully embraces being among the faithful. Map transition and we're back at the orc pits, and we see the tree on the map is the one they're digging near. Methor reveals to Arondir that the orcs are searching for something as they dig to all these villages. Best guess here is they're searching for the dagger that Theo has. The Watch Warden mentions this Adar person is someone the orcs revere, and that Morgoth has a successor. Arondir points out it's odd orcs would use an elvish word, which incidentally means father, to refer to Sauron. After a confrontation with the orcs about cutting down the tree in the way, one of the orcs, who seems to be wearing a First Age elven helmet, offers them water. With quite a bit of tension, the elves drink one by one, when suddenly the lead orc cuts Methor's throat while he drinks. As he dies in Arondir's arms, the Watch Warden yells Hunahraven at the orcs, which means a cursed beast. Arondir says he will cut down the tree, and says Anin Apsene asking the tree to forgive him as he begins chopping. All around we see the destruction caused by the orcs, and I'm really curious to see if there's an explanation for the green pits and smoke we see on the left side here. Now what's of deeper significance here is that while all the elves have some level of appreciation for nature and beauty and such things, sylvan elves have a particular affinity for trees. As we see many realms inhabited by sylvan elves, are indeed woodlands like Greenwood, where Legolas will be from, and Galadriel's future land of Lorien. Back in Numenor, Galadriel has escaped her guard and looks to commandeer a ship. However, she doesn't give Elendil the slip, as he confronts her about the futility of her attempt. When Galadriel gets on her high horse again, Elendil says he has a daughter who runs fast and a son who runs blind, and that Galadriel's eyes bear a striking resemblance to both which pretty much cuts to the heart of this version of Galadriel we've seen thus far. Her single-mindedness, or as I like to say, acting Feanorian, is her biggest flaw. Though for most of the time thus far, it's also been her one character trait. Galadriel says being anywhere is better than here, where everyone hates her. And Elendil answers that not all hate her, but he says it in Quenya. He reveals it's still taught in the Hall of Lore, and carved on statues throughout the city. They take off on horseback to the Hall of Lore, and apparently Galadriel likes horses, because she seems really happy in what seems like a pretty hokey shot to me. Halbrand shows back up at the smithies, saying no one on the island knows the craft more than he. Again, this could be a clue in favor of the Sauron theory, as Sauron was one of the Maiar who originally served Aule, the smith of the Valar. 
The guy tells Halbrand, no crest, no forge. So Halbrand goes to have some seafood where after a rocky start, he buys drinks for the Numenorean workers and gets them to let their guard down so he can steal one of their crests. Of note here is that they keep calling Halbrand Low Man, which is an indication of how the Numenoreans at this time have really come to consider themselves as better than the men of Middle-earth in a derogatory way. Turns out they notice Halbrand stole the crest and jump him in an alley. He beats them all up in what is the most human-on-human -human violence we've seen in a Middle-earth adaptation. Though at most, it's only the second most violent part of this episode. Guards come to the scene and take Halbrand away. We get to the Hall of Lore and Galadriel draws Sauron's mark, which Elendil gives to someone so they can do an old school Google image search of the archives. We learn the archives were built by Elros, twin brother of Elrond, and we see a painting of the two as they part. In the behind the scenes stills, we see that Eärendil's ship is depicted centered above the brothers in the sky on this tapestry. Elendil goes on to say that it's because of Tar Palantir that the archives have not been torn down, for he is loyal to the elves. Because of this loyalty, the king is confined to his tower, an exile in his own kingdom. Ask Jeeves comes back with an account of a human spy retrieved from an enemy dungeon, and it turns out I was right and the symbol is a map of Mordor. Turns out there was a contingency plan should Morgoth be defeated, that Sauron and the orcs would create a land for evil to thrive. I'm curious to see how this plays out and if it's explained why it would take a thousand years for them to activate this plan. Halfway through the episode, we've got Harfoots doing who knows what through the woods. We catch up with Largo and Marigold and it sounds like Largo's first wife, and I'm guessing Nori's mom died and that Marigold is his second wife. And they talk about how his foot injury is not a great development for folks about to go on the move. Nori and Poppy swipe Sadduk's star map, and we actually get into a speech that kind of takes a dark turn. They read off names of hobbits who fell behind during prior migrations. And I gotta say, it's kind of dark stuff. Turns out there's no such phrase as no Harfoot left behind. They'll totally leave you behind if you get stuck in the snow. We find out Poppy is an orphan and that her entire family was killed by a landslide. Someone related to Sadduk was taken by wolves. The stranger shows up, probably looking for some delicious snails, and he finds his constellation on the map. The fires throughout the camp grow as Meteor Man makes the discovery, but whoops, apparently he's not used to hot fires that actually burn stuff and the map catches fire. He stumbles through the camp, scaring the Harfoots and accidentally ratting out Nori by saying her name. When asked about a being falling from the stars, Sadik says he's heard of a being turned into a star, which is an obvious reference to Eärendil, but I can't help but wonder how one of the Harfoots, who won't be on the radar of elves and men for centuries, would know the tale of Eärendil. It seems like a big stretch just to fit in an Easter egg. In another dark twist, turns out as punishment, they should be kicked out of the clan. But since Nori is young, Sadik says her family can stay, but they'll be at the back of the caravan. And since we've established Harfoot stick to the pirate code of those who fall behind or left behind, it's looking kind of grim for the Brandyfoots. Back in Numenor, we have some puppet theater going on, and I'm not sure what they're playing out here. This kind of looks like Muriel, and we definitely have Galadriel who swoops in. And the big tall guy, I think, might be a reference to Morgoth. Though Galadriel fighting Morgoth one-on-one -on -one and living to tell the tale is kind of crazy. My guess is maybe these are just some folks puppeteering their fan fiction for the crowd. Isildur has apparently heard of Galadriel, but the conversation quickly turns to Isildur's upcoming sea trials. Isildur says he wants to defer. So we've got like a reverse Luke Skywalker situation here. Isildur wants to put his application into the Academy next year, not this one. Isildur mentions Anarion and it hits a nerve a bit. Sounds like Anarion has perhaps run away to the Western shores, likely Endunie, where their family's from, and Isildur wants to do the same. Elendil delivers his line that there's nothing left for them on the western shores, and that the past is dead. They either move forward or die with it. Some helpful context here is that Elendil is a widower, and after his wife's passing, he moved his family to the capital. Now, as we've started to see in this episode, he's got an internal conflict between his head, which tells him to keep his family safe by going along with the trends of Numenor, and his heart, which lies with the ways of the faithful. 
After one of those dad moments where you lose your temper and immediately feel like crap, Elendil puts his foot down with a seal door, telling him he'll be at the trials. Then we discover that Aearian, whose name incidentally means Daughter of the Sea, got accepted into the Builder's Guild, meaning she is likely an architect. Galadriel pays a visit to the cell where Halbrand is locked up, and shows him her second image search came back with a match for the mark on Halbrand's pouch. Halbrand says he just got it off a dead man, but Galadriel doesn't buy it. She says it was the mark of his ancestor who united the men of the Southlands. Halbrand counters that it was that man's ancestor who swore a blood oath to Morgoth and that his family lost that war. Galadriel says it was her family that started it, which, okay, I, I guess. I would say it was definitely Morgoth who started the beef by stealing the Silmarils though. Galadriel then goes on to say theirs was no chance meeting and says it was the work of something greater. This implies that Galadriel believes Eru Iluvatar, the god of Tolkien's world, brought them together. Now we know in Lord of the Rings there are a couple specific times where Eru does intervene, sending Gandalf back as Gandalf the White, and possibly when Gollum slips and falls with the ring into the fires of Mount Doom. Now I don't think what we have here is direct intervention by Eru. Instead, I think we're seeing how Galadriel is so desperate to find Sauron that she's convincing herself this encounter is somehow ordained and will result in helping her track down the new Dark Lord. She also tells Halbrand to go back to Middle-earth with her so they can redeem both their bloodlines. Halbrand's I understand, but I guess Galadriel is talking about her oath she took because of Finrod's death? I don't know, I guess redeeming is not something I thought the House of Finarfin was in need of. Unless maybe she's talking about the broader Noldor. Also of note is the statue in the middle of this room. Best guess here is that this is of Uinin, one of the Maiar associated with Ulmo, the Lord of Waters. Uinin is the wife of the Maya Ose. It is said Uinin could calm the tumultuous waves of her husband, and for this she was loved by mariners. Specifically, she was revered by the Numenorians. So when it comes to Halbrand, there's a lot of theories out there about him being either Sauron or the Witch King. There were definitely some moments that made me think of Sauron in this episode, but some others that really have me thinking and honestly rooting for Witch King. He seems like an off-kilter version of Aragorn, and I could see it being really interesting if he attempts to do the right thing and unite his people against Sauron but ultimately fails where Aragorn will later succeed. I'm really curious to hear what you guys think are the odds on Halbrand's true identity. We next come to one of the towers at night where Muriel visits her father Tar Palantir, who we don't see, and says the moment they feared is here. The elf has arrived. My best guess is that they knew that should it ever come to pass that an elf arrived in Numenor seeking aid, they would be forced to make a choice. Either Muriel declares herself openly as a faithful Numenorian, or she turns her back on the elves. I think the whole Tar Palantir being in exile was a savvy move orchestrated by he and his daughter that she would pretend to align with the king's men to forestall any attempt by Farazhan to seize the throne. Just a hunch, but I feel reasonably confident in that guess. Next we catch up with the Harfoot migration already in progress, where Largo and family are struggling to keep up. Turns out there's a big old stranger in the cart, which no doubt adds to the weight. Meteor Man helps push the cart and hopes the family can keep up with those cutthroat Harfoots. Back to the orc pit where the elves try to make a daring escape. We get some really cool elven acrobatics and things look promising as a Rondir exposes the orcs to sunlight. Problem is the orcs have a warg. And fans of things like Game of Thrones may scoff, but for a Middle-earth adaptation, we see quite a bit more in the way of violence against human-like creatures than we're accustomed to. Orondir temporarily traps Ugly Sonic and does a cool little flippy thing to stab an orc with a stick. And the Watch Warden makes a run for it and hopes one of them can escape. As Orondir climbs to the top, he finds instead that his friend has been given the Boromir treatment. Orondir yells, Hano, which means brother and is pulled back to the pit where an orc is stopped from killing him. Instead, he will be brought to Adar. And the final shot is our first kind of look at Adar, as it's totally blurry, which in retrospect, it's kind of humorous that the episode would be titled for a character we only kind of sort of meet in the last shot. 
So what do you guys think of episode three? Personally, I'm a big fan of Elendil, which I kind of expected I would be. I think Numenor and the practical effects orcs look great. This first episode after the premiere had my interest with the Numenor stuff, and I'm eager to see more of the dynamics at play, but I can't help but feel like we're still kind of getting things in motion. This was the first episode where I was truly annoyed at being taken away to the Harfoot storyline, as personally my interest in that part of the tale is far more about the Stranger than the migration of the Hobbits, and the Stranger story didn't move forward much in this one. It looks like we may be getting more from Casa Doom and Numenor in episode 4, but first I want to know what you guys thought of this episode. Let me know what you think in the comments. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Kella Brimbor, The Mighty Mim, Team Weasel, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, Toby Mobs Music, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Berto Berg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.